Hi, welcome to video number nine. Today we're going to be looking at classifying the elements based on their chemical properties. More specifically, we're going to be looking at how elements are classified based on their chemical reactivity with some other chemical element. And so, based on that, we can classify elements into groups, and from those groups we'll be able to make some predictions and some generalizations on the way that the elements belonging to that group uh, behave. All right. The first such attempt was done around 1817 by a German by the name of Johannes Doberreiner. Now, Doberreiner found out that if you reacted elements, for example, with chlorine, you could find small groups, groups of three elements that have similar reactivity. In other words, that they would give you similar uh, products. All right. So if we look at the example here of the alkali metals, if we see that lithium, sodium, and potassium all react similarly with chlorine to give you the following formulas. Lithium gives you lithium chloride, one lithium to one chlorine, sodium chloride, one sodium to one chlorine, and potassium chloride, one potassium to one chlorine. So based on that, he makes a group. Now, what he noticed is that when he organized lithium, sodium, and potassium based on their atomic mass, he noticed that the two extremes, lithium and potassium, when added together, an average would give you the atomic mass of the middle one. So if we notice that, okay, 6.9 plus 39.1 added together gives you 46. We average that, or we divide it by 2, and it's 23, which happens to be exactly the mass of the middle member of the triad. Doberreiner also found out that this happened for several other triads, and even though the numbers are not exact, they are very close. If we see the sum of the masses of chlorine and iodine, it's going to be 81.2, close enough to the 80, roughly speaking, that we have for uh, bromine. Similarly, if we add the masses of calcium and barium, we get very close to the average mass for strontium, and if we add the masses of uh, sulfur and tellurium, we get very, very close to the mass of selenium. So clearly there is something to be said about the way that um, these triads are organized and the fact that there are some properties that seem to change in some type of periodic or gradual change. Uh, a little bit later on, we find out that a Russian by the name of Dmitry Ivanovich Mendeleev came up with a way of organizing all the known elements at the time. At the time when he was doing this, there were 63 elements, only about half of the elements that we have uh, nowadays. And he organized them all first by uh, atomic number. He put them in increasing atomic number. And then he made the groups based on how uh, their chemical properties were. Now, there was somebody else who had been doing similar work, a German by the name of uh, Lothar Julius Mayer. Um, but the problem was that uh, Mayer did not publish his results, and therefore he did not get as much uh, fame um, or claim for his results. Uh, so we're going to continue looking at what Mendeleev did. Mendeleev, as you see here, was able to get eight groups, all right? And we can see if we just check at the formulas, is here's, a, for example, group by the reaction with oxygen. And he noticed that he also could react them with hydrogen and get similar uh, members for the group. So that's uh, where we're going to be looking at that. Now, for group one, he found all the, comp all the elements that would give a formula of R2O. So there would be two atoms of the element in group one to one, ele one oxygen atom. In group two, one atom of group two to one oxygen atom, etc., etc., and that allowed him to put these elements uh, in in good groups, which then he could predict little things for. One of the interesting things that Mendeleev did do is that he left some blank spaces. You can see some of them here, because when he was looking, for example, at where to put titanium. He noticed that titanium would not fit 
into group 3, but rather it had much more similarities with group 4. So Mendeleev predicted that there would be another element to be discovered later on that would go into group 3, all right, and uh, instead just left uh, titanium in group 4 where it matched the characteristics. He did this all over the periodic table. He left a bunch of different blank spaces saying that there would be elements to be discovered. He didn't only just say that though. Because of the characteristics that he could have for a group, he was able to then predict what those characteristics may be. And so he predicted, for example, the characteristics for this element, element number 68, which I have listed down here. All right? And that element, if we actually look for it nowadays, we'll find it to be gallium. All right? When he predicted the properties for gallium, it wasn't known as gallium at the time, all right? But when he predicted this element, which he had called eka aluminum for below aluminum, he predicted that it would have a mass of approximately 68, a density of 5.9 grams per milliliter, that it would have a low melting point, so some, some melting point somewhat uh, in the vicinity of room temperature, and that it would have a formula in which we would have two atoms of the metal to three atoms of the oxygen. Well, when we found out gallium, 69.7, the density is almost identical at 5.903. It has a low melting point at just 30 degrees Celsius, and it has a formula of two atoms of gallium for every three atoms of oxygen for the oxide. So Mendeleev was able to predict very, very, very carefully how um, uh, all the properties of this particular uh, element. Now, after Mendeleev, we modified the periodic table a little bit. The very first change that was made to the periodic table was done by Henry Moseley. Henry Moseley was an Englishman who discovered how to measure the number of protons in the nucleus of each atom and therefore gave us the idea of the atomic number. Now Henry Moseley did not make a huge revolution to the uh, periodic table other than saying that instead of being organized by increasing atomic mass and groups by chemical properties, it should be organized first by increasing atomic number. Therefore, he was able to explain much more carefully why and how many blank spaces needed to be left in certain areas. And so he could predict much more accurately the number of unknown atoms to be discovered between some of uh, the blank spaces left by Mendeleev. All right? So uh, mostly gives us that, or says that the chemical and physical properties of elements are actually a periodic function, a gradual function, a repeating function, if you may, of the atomic number, i.e. of the number of protons. So that is going to be what's going to be most important. Now, how do we get to the modern periodic table, the one that we see here so commonly? All right. Well, that is going to be the work of a, a man by the name of Glenn Seaborg. Glenn Seaborg is an American, and what he noticed is that if you looked at um, the valence electrons and the last orbital occupied by an uh, electron, you can actually make 18 groups or more than 18 groups um, in the periodic table. And so you can start getting better groups uh, that would be smaller and yet more detailed, you could predict more carefully what characteristics and what the changes to those properties are going to be. All right. If you notice, if we go down the first group, uh, hydrogen ends in 1s1, while lithium ends in 2s1, sodium in 3s1, potassium in 4s1, rubidium 5s1, cesium 6s1, and finally francium in 7s1. So all of the members of the first group all end in an S1. And that is why Seaborg actually puts them now into that first group. He separates the elements that were before by Mendeleev's table in group one that do not end in S1, and he sets them aside in a different um, spot. Same thing if we saw 
for the elements that are in second group, the ones that S end in S2. All right, so we can see that beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, and radium all have similar characteristics as well. So, since the pattern follows all throughout the periodic table, we can see, and I have written in here, for example, for groups one and for group two. But similarly, we can see that if we are looking at a group like group seven, all of the elements in group seven end in a P5, all right? And so fluorine ends in a 2P5, while chlorine ends in a 3P5, bromine 4P5, iodine 5P5, and acetine in 6P5. So it is that last orbital that allows us to classify the groups or the elements into particular columns or groups, all right? Now, because there are four basic types of uh, orbitals, we're going to have our elements blocked out or into four distinct regions of the periodic table. And those are going to be the S block, all right, uh, in which we have two columns. We're going to have the P block, in which we have six columns. Then we've got the D block, in which we have 10 columns. And finally, we're going to have the F block, in which we have 14 columns. All right, And this is all summarized uh, down here for you to be able to see. All right, So we've got our four blocks, S, P, D, and F. And each block contains the same number of columns as the maximum number of electrons that can be held in that particular type of orbital. So I can now use the periodic table to predict where the last electron of a particular atom would fall. All right? And so I can come and look at, at this. If I look at the S, all right? And if I was looking at this element here, all right? It doesn't matter what the element is. But I know that because it's in period 4 is going to end up in 4s, and it's the second s column, so it's going to be 4s2. So when we look at, at the at element, we know that that's calcium, all right? And calcium will indeed finish in a 4s2 um, orbit, uh, orbital, all right? If we were to look, for example, here at this element over here, I'm going to go ahead and choose this one, all right? Well, I look, notice that it says that it's a 3D row, all right? It's one less than the period. So I'm going to say that this is going to end in 3D, and then I count the number of rows. One, two, three, four, five, six. And so, therefore, the last electron for this element would be a 3D6. And that happens to be the last electron for iron. The previous one that we had looked at had been calcium. All right? So I can do that for every element in the periodic table uh, based on the position um, of the element into one of those blocks. And so, for example, uh, one more time, if we come all the way down here and we look at this element, this would be an element that would finish, as we see, in 5F, and it's 1, 2, 3, 4, all right? And that would be the position of uranium, all right? And that's the reason why this is a little bit strange is because um, we're actually starting with the lanthanide and actinium, all right? This would be actually lanthanide and actinium would be over here, all right? Um, and so that would give us that way of looking at this, all right? We can also predict the number of valence electrons and the number of the valence shell. The valence shell is always going to be equal to the period number. So for calcium, the valence shell is going to be number four because that's the period. For iron, the valence shell is also going to be number four. The number of valence electrons the ones that are going to be in the valence shell are always going to be 
the electrons in the S or the P shells. So if you're going across a period like we have here in period four, all right, you're going to go ha having one valence electron, two valence electrons. All of the transition metals going through here are only going to have two valence electrons because those are the S. Once you get over here, you start getting to the four Ps, and so you start adding some valence electrons. So, for example, if we had an element right over here, that element would have its last orbital. All right, that, that would happen to be bromine, by the way. And so bromine would have its last orbital in a 4p5. And how do I know it's 5? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. All right. And how many valence electrons? Well, since it's in the same row, we had already completed the 4s. So we have 4s2. And we're going to have a 4p5. So a total of 7 valence electrons. I know this is a little bit more complicated, so keep in mind that this is an easy way of finding this, all right? So the number of the valence shell is equal to the period in which this is, is um, located. The number of valence electrons depends on what block you are. If you're in block, in the S block, it depends which column you are. If you're in the D or the F blocks, your valence number of valence electrons is always going to be 2. There are some exceptions, but we're not going to worry about those exceptions. And if you're in the P block, it will be the column in the P block that you are, plus two more, which are the 2S um, valence electrons. So having said that, this is how the real periodic table looks like. The real periodic table has the long um, lanthanide and actinide series placed in between um, the D block, all right, and the S block, all right? So this is more of a correct um, representation of the periodic table, but we do not use that because it's too long, and so it makes the numbers too small, all right? So that's why we tend to uh, use the other version. So having done this, I want you to try the following exercises. First, try to write uh, the last occupied orbital just based on the position of the periodic table for ruthenium, phosphorus, xenon, uh, thallium, europium, and um, um, uranium. All right, I've given you a couple of those uh, ahead of time, or at least uranium I have. Then how many valence electrons are present uh, in each one of the atoms that I listed above? And finally, what is the common characteristics of all members of group six? All right, give that a try. Uh, if you can do it, and all beautiful, excellent, and if not, still give it your best try. That is the most important. See you next time.